Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I wanted to welcome you all to this year's Nordenberg Lecture. Um, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Chip Carter, and I have the privilege of serving as dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Um, my role here is twofold. First off, to welcome you, uh, and secondly, to introduce Professor Meisel, who will uh, tell you a little bit more about the lecture as well as our speaker. Uh, so I won't steal his thunder in that regard, but I can tell you you're in for a real treat, um, both because I had the pleasure of having dinner with our speaker last night, um, who is incredibly engaging um, and informative, so I think you'll find her to be the same. Um, and also, uh, because I have her PowerPoint slides here, I could tell you what she's going to say, but I'm not going to do that. I think it'll be much better coming from her. Um, the second part of my job is, as I said, to introduce Professor Meisel. Um, and I will be brief, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a law professor, because uh, I do want to get to the substance. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, a few words about Alan um, and his impact on the law school and the university. So let me share with you um, some of the many accomplishments that Professor Meisel has had before I welcome him to the podium to introduce our speaker. Professor Alan Meisel, as you know, is a leading national and international authority on end-of-life decision-making and informed consent to medical treatment. Professor Meisel, among his dozens of books and articles, is the principal author of the treatise, The Right to Die, The, end of, the Law of End-of-Life Decision-Making. The first edition of that book won the 1989 Association of American Publishers Award for Outstanding Book in the Legal Practice category. Professor Meisel has published widely in the fields of health law and medical ethics in numerous legal, medical, and ethical journals. He served on the ethics working group of the White House Task Force on Healthcare Reform in 1993 and was assistant director for legal studies at the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine in 1982, where he helped to draft that commission's studies on informed consent and end-of-life decision-making. Professor Meisel, among his many uh, honorary positions, is a fellow of the Hastings Center and has served as a consultant to the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment in its studies on life-sustaining technologies and institutional protocols for healthcare decision-making. Professor Meisel is the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics and Health Law, the founding director of the law school's health law certificate program, which is nationally renowned, and is also the founder and director of the law school's Master's of Studies in Law program. So as you can tell, we keep him busy. Um, on top of all of those formal responsibilities, I would be remiss if I, I didn't note and express my appreciation um, for his excellence uh, as a scholar, but also his excellence as a uh, teacher and member of the community. Uh, Alan regularly goes above and beyond in terms of his institutional service and is particularly passionate and committed about uh, assisting our students who seek careers in the health law field. So I wanted to publicly express my appreciation for all that you do, um, for your role in this lecture, and for all that you've contributed to the university and the law school. So without further ado, I give you Professor Alan Meisel. Thank you, Chip, for those kind words. I think it's now time for me to retire. That sounded like the kind of speech one would give at such an event. Uh, let me add my welcome to you uh, to the 15th annual Mark Nordenberg Lecture in Law, Medicine, and Psychiatry. This lectureship was established in the year 2000 by Dr. Thomas Detry, the former Senior Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences and the former Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. And it was established to honor uh, then Chancellor and now Chancellor Emeritus, Mark Nordenberg, by bringing to the University of Pittsburgh outstanding experts in the fields of law, medicine, and psychiatry to address some of the most vexing and intriguing issues confronting the disciplines of law and medicine. And I'm pleased that Chancellor Nordenberg is here today, back on his home turf, where he was our colleague and dean for many years. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. We're honored today to have Professor Sidney Watson, who is professor of, of law at St. Louis University School of Law and the Center for Health Law Studies. She also holds an appointment at the university's College for Public Health and Social Justice. She's a former legal services attorney whose research focuses on issues relating to access to health care for the poor, racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, and other disenfranchised groups. 
Professor Watson has authored more than 40 law review articles and other publications, including recent articles on health reform, racial disparities, Medicaid, and rural health care. She's actively involved in the health reform debate and works closely with grassroots consumer advocates advocating for Medicaid expansion in Missouri. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sidney Watson, who will speak on Medicaid expansion. Alan, thank you so much for the introduction, and Dean, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be at Pittsburgh, uh, where there's such a wonderful history of a health law program. Uh, all of us who teach in the health law area know Alan's work. We also know his mentoring of students and many of our fellow faculty members over the years and appreciate it. And while many of you probably know Mary Crosley as a former dean here, we in health law teaching know her also as a colleague and a really valuable valuable scholar uh, with her writing on civil rights and about people with disabilities. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to double mic myself, partly because I'm a little short. Uh, I'm not quite sure you can see me. Can you see me? Um, I may just stay here, but we'll see what happens if I need to. Maybe I'll do it this way and see what happens. So I want to talk about Medicaid today because Medicaid's important. Um, we forget sometimes that it's the largest health insurance program in the country, covering more people than Medicare does, and certainly more than all private insurance put together. Um, the Affordable Care Act also grows Medicaid, which means it becomes even more important as we go forward. Um, and it's also a program that covers people over its lifespan. Um, right now, many births in this country are covered by Medicaid, and Medicaid is also the program that covers our elderly, the major source of nursing home care uh, in this country. Medicaid's important because it's big. Medicaid is also important because of its federalism structure. It is a federal state program, funded at least half for each state by federal dollars, and one that gives states a lot of discretion and a lot of flexibility to set up and operate the program within parameters set up by federal law. And that federalism dynamic is really important as we think about the future of both Medicaid and other federal state programs. The particular dynamic I want to talk about today are waivers. Uh, suddenly, an arcane piece of the Medicaid law has become the topic I think of an editorial in today's uh, local newspaper. It's talked about in newspapers in Missouri, too. So I want to talk about these waivers and talk about what they tell us. I think about the future of Medicaid, the future of health reform, the future of programs for poor people in these countries. Um, in terms of parts of this talk, I want to give a little background about Medicaid. I then want to give you a little background about the law of waivers. Uh, particularly demonstration waivers. I then want to take you on a tour of the U.S. talking about some of the waivers that have been granted for Medicaid expansion, stopping for a little bit in Pennsylvania. A little afraid, too, that I'm going to say something not right about Pennsylvania. Uh, and end with some predictions for the future where I think waivers and federalism are likely to go. Um, but let me start with this slide. Um, this is a photo of 23 clergy being arrested in the Missouri Senate last April. It was a week before the end of the session. They were engaged in an act of civil disobedience to express their opinion that the Medicaid expansion is a moral issue. It is an ethical issue. And I begin my talk with that because I don't want to hide my opinions about Medicaid expansion and health reform in general. Um, having health insurance does save lives. The Affordable Care Act is important because without health insurance, people die sooner, they have bankruptcies because they can't afford medical care, and we have a less healthy and a less wealthy workforce as a result. It really is a social justice issue, and I agree with the clergy about that. Now, in talking about the politics of waivers and Medicaid expansion, I could replace their angry faces uh, with some angry faces of governors 
who have objected to what they have asked the Department of HHS to do in terms of waivers. So there's a lot of anger here. Um, but it's also important to realize how the Affordable Care Act has changed the debate about the role of Medicaid, and particularly this expansion for Medicaid. Uh, the structure of the Affordable Care Act is that we more or less left employer-sponsored health insurance as it is in this country, recognizing that more and more people are in jobs or in contract positions where they do not get employer-sponsored insurance and that we need to create alternatives to employer-sponsored insurance if we want to cover most or all Americans. The Affordable Care Act did that in a couple of ways. One, create this new marketplace where people who use the individual market for themselves and their family can go on the marketplace, better competition, we're seeing actually better prices in terms of premiums, and even more importantly, new premium tax credits to bring down the cost of marketplace plans for moderate income families. Families earning between 100 and 400 percent of poverty, that's about $11,000 to $44,000 $44, a year for a single person. It ranges from about $30,000 a year up to uh, $80,000 a year for $90,000 a year for a family of four. And it's a real breakthrough in terms of access for affordable health insurance for moderate income families. The fundamental building block for the Affordable Care Act and health reform was supposed to be a Medicaid expansion for the poorest Americans, the foundation below the marketplace, to cover families and individuals, working age adults between 18 and 64, who earned up to or near the poverty level. The figure is 133% of poverty. That's a little above that $11,000, about $15,000 for a single person. And the way the Affordable Care Act was supposed to work is we would have both pieces in place, the foundation of Medicaid and then the marketplace plans with subsidies, and we'd cover not everyone, but closer to everyone. The problem was in NFIB v. Sebelius, the Supreme Court decided that the states had a choice whether to expand Medicaid. Um, this is what it looks like if you want to graph it out without the Medicaid expansion. Um, over on and this, oops, it goes backwards when it's behind me. Uh, these are the folks who are able now to go into the marketplace uh, to get the subsidies. Very poor adults who are either disabled, permanently and totally disabled, or who are parents can qualify for Medicaid. That number at the bottom, 19% of poverty. In Missouri, a family of three earning more than $301 a month makes too much to qualify for Medicaid. We have one of the lowest Medicaid eligibility levels in the country. These eligibility levels are set by states. Yours here in Missouri is a whopping 38 percent of poverty. Among the states that have not yet decided to expand Medicaid, the average is under 50 percent of poverty. That gap in the middle is called the Medicaid gap. That's what the Medicaid expansion is designed to cover. That is what is at stake when we talk about is a state going to take advantage of the Affordable Care Act's expansion for adults, filling in that gap. And who are those people? Uh, this lady is Bertha. She's from a small town in southern Missouri. Some of my students interviewed her. Uh, like 80% of people who fall in this Medicaid expansion category, she works. She's a home health aide. She works part time because she also takes care of her uh, granddaughter. She makes too much. She makes above $301 a month. She cannot qualify for Medicaid in Missouri without being found to be permanently and totally disabled. And she desperately wants to keep working because she's also taking care of a disabled husband. And I could tell you lots and more about these folks, uh, but by and large, it's folks like Bertha who work every day, who we see every day, who serve us food at lunch and coffee in the morning, who fall in the Medicaid gap. Um, but you know, 
I want to talk a little bit about some things that did happen January 1, 2014 to Medicaid that aren't up for debate in terms of Medicaid's federalism. And they are changes to the Medicaid program that were part of the Affordable Care Act. They have taken effect. They were never challenged in the Supreme Court case. Uh, and by and large, it's occurred. And so that's why I have a map that's all one shade. Uh, this has all happened. Uh, as Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act moved health insurance to a system where we want to let everyone in, we don't want to keep people out, we changed the rules of Medicaid to bring people in rather than to keep people out. The old rules of Medicaid were based upon a Medicaid model. Medicaid, when it was originally set up in 1965, was considered a side benefit to people who got welfare. And those welfare rules were imported into Medicaid. And welfare rules tend to stigmatize people. They tend to try to identify the worthy poor we considered able to, should get help from unworthy people. It's things like you have to fill out a long form. You have to prove how much money you have in the bank. You've got to have a visit to the welfare department. The Affordable Care Act changed almost all of these rules for children, for low-income parents who get Medicaid now, and for people in this expansion group. And how do they change it? We no longer ask people to prove how much money they have in the bank. And we don't ask those questions for the new marketplace plans. Our goal is to cover everyone in a social insurance system. We'll look at your income this year. We change the income rules. So the way we count income for the new marketplace plans are the same way we count income uh, for children and for working age adults. And you know what? We can electronically check and match that income because we have data hubs that can check it. No longer do you have to bring in your pay stubs to the welfare department. No longer do you have to gather up things that are going to be lost. Our whole goal with the Affordable Care Act was to cover 52 million more people. And you know, to make that work, you've got to streamline it. And we're trying to streamline Medicaid as part of that. We've changed the application forms. So you can apply for Medicaid when you go into the marketplace to apply for a marketplace plan. and. The computer helps figure out which program works for you. There's no longer one door you go in for Medicaid and another door you go in for others. The whole idea was to move Medicaid out of its welfare past and make it part of a new social insurance system that has multiple kinds of insurance, with Medicaid being one piece of that insurance system. At the same time, we maintained Medicaid as a safety net insurer. And in some ways, that means Medicaid is very unique. Medicaid has always covered more benefits and different benefits than private health insurance has. It's actually called medical assistance rather than the word being insurance. So historically, Medicaid has covered transportation to help people get to medical care um, because we know that lack of transportation is a primary barrier for low-income people. Medicaid has also covered nursing home care and home-based care that private insurance doesn't cover. And a lot of that stays in Medicaid. Medicaid has had more generous protections in terms of out-of-pocket costs. Uh, because we know poor people have less money to be able to pay the doctor when they see it. And we left that safety net benefit package, cost-sharing protections in place as we moved Medicaid forward. What's different, though, is the question now, the federalism question, of whether states are going to expand Medicaid. You can find lots of these maps up on um, the web of which states are expanding Medicaid, which aren't. My map today shows you in blue, different shades of blue, states that have committed to this Medicaid expansion for people earning up to 133%. 
adults between 18 and 64. Um, the gold, the yellow states are the ones that aren't moving forward as of today. And uh, my own state of Missouri is in there, although I do have to tell you, like many of these other states, there's a really active debate going on. Um, the lighter blue states that include Pennsylvania are states that wanted to do it, quote, their own way. And that gets me to talking about waivers. When the Supreme Court decided the health reform case and said that Medicaid would be at the state's voluntary choice, there seemed to be a lot of interest among what I will call recalcitrant, or reluctant states. I'll call the orange states the, re the recalcitrant states. Reluctant states where they said, you know, maybe we'll consider this, but we want to do it our way. We don't want the Obama administration or any federal government telling us how to run our Medicaid program, although we are taking those federal dollars. Um, this is an opportunity, though, to design a program that's more like what we want in our state. And that's where waivers come in. Medicaid has things that states must do, minimum requirements. It also has a lot of optional things that states can do at their if they like. There are then provisions that are called waivers. When I talk to my law students about it, I say a waiver is permission to break federal Medicaid law. A waiver gives a state permission to do something that is not authorized by the federal Medicaid statute, but still get federal money to pay for what they're doing. It's really interesting, isn't it? And a lot of pundits and a lot of scholars thought when the Supreme Court decided the health reform case that the Obama administration was going to be in a position of not having, being in a very bad negotiating position. That really governors and state legislators were going to be able to negotiate some really interesting deals that might change the nature of Medicaid as we know it. What I want to talk about today, though, what we didn't anticipate is how the Affordable Care Act has changed the law of waivers. There is a new rule of law for Medicaid waivers, and it really explains a lot of what has happened and what has not happened in the waiver negotiations that have gone on between the states and the federal government. So let me give you a little primer on waivers. The kind of waivers I'm going to talk about today are called Section 1115 Demonstration Waivers. 1115, because that's the section of the Social Security Act they're in. Uh, they actually predate Medicaid. And this quote I've got is the way they're described in lots of law review articles, Kaiser Family Foundation reports, Commonwealth Foundation reports. Section 1115 grants the Secretary discretionary authority to waive certain certain provisions of the Medicaid Act for experimental pilot or demonstration programs likely to assist in promoting the objectives of the Medicaid Act, and although not required by the statute or even by re regulations, there's a long-standing tradition that the Secretary will only grant a Section 1115 waiver if it doesn't cost the federal government any more. That makes sense. It's called budget neutrality. Um, and you know, you look at that and you go, wow, that's a lot of authority. That was the next sentence in the law review articles, right? The secretary has a lot of authority. And what happened was, although Section 1115 waivers started out as very limited pilot projects that generally had a hypothesis, a very clear evaluation, there was a lot of work for School of Public Health in the early days of 1115 waivers doing these evaluations. Over the years, they changed, they multiplied, they were, they took on a life of their own. It began with the Clinton administration, and we all remember what Clinton was before he was president, right? He was a governor. And governors like flexibility in Medicaid, right? And the Clinton administration, we often say, it handed out 1115 waivers like they were gumballs. Uh, suddenly, the Clinton administration was interested in allowing governors to have the flexibility they wanted. 
It was a time when we were cutting back on the federal government. The government's, federal government stopped doing evaluations of these experimental programs. They allowed them to continue for years. When the Bush administration came in, they again continued to very freely give out 1115 waivers. They weren't as interested in much in mere flexibility. They had some substantive policies they were interested in, particularly encouraging states to use Medicaid expansions that looked more like private insurance with fewer benefits, more costs to poor people. And all of this was done in the tradition of, of waiver negotiation. All of it done behind closed doors, you very often didn't hear about a waiver proposal until it was granted. There was no opportunity to talk about it, to have a public forum. It was done behind closed doors. And if you think about that history of Section 1115, and that's your understanding of Section 1115, if you're a governor in Pennsylvania or Indiana or Missouri, you think, wow, it's all up for grabs now. What is a Medicaid expansion going to look like? What are we going to negotiate? This is what I want to leave you with. The Affordable Care Act changes all of this. It changes it in two ways, substantive law and procedural law. So let me talk first about um, the substantive law. And here's a piece that was missing from the last slide. It's missing from most law review articles. You know, law professors do strange things in their offices. I spent a lot of time reading all the old uh, Medicaid articles, seeing how we talk about it. The secretary only has the authority under Section 1115 to waive provisions in Section 1902 of the Medicaid Act. Well, so how many of you have read the Medicaid Act? Yeah. Um, I, let me point out to you that a num three federal judges in different opinions have described the Medicaid Act as an assault on the English language, uh, Byzantine and incomprehensible. And then I think the third judge you can't even quote. It, it was curse words. Um, it, it is a very convoluted uh, statute. Section 1902 goes on for pages and pages and pages. The short version for Today, not everything is in 1902 of the Medicaid Act. The Secretary simply does not have legal authority to waive anything and everything pursuant to a Section 1115 waiver. And actually, this ends up being not a policy analysis, but very much a textual analysis. If you want the Secretary to waive something, and you are a governor or a state legislator or a Medicaid director in a state, you better figure out where it is in 1902. You've got to figure out where it is in 1902. And more importantly, the world has shifted on you. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, lots of states used Section 1115 waivers to expand coverage to adults they otherwise couldn't cover under the Medicaid Act. That's my second bullet point. They used expansions to cover childless adults. How did they do that? They got a waiver of 1902, which lists all the groups that can be covered. And prior to the Affordable Care Act, there was no group for childless adults. And that was fine. Um, and it worked quite well. And CMS took the position that if they waive 1902 to allow coverage of these adults who otherwise weren't allowed to be covered under the Act, there really were no other protections in the Act that applied to those people. So the states could design premiums and cost sharing and benefits that looked very different from what they provided to people who qualified under the Act. So Missouri has one of these expansions. The coverage doesn't include hospital care. It only includes visits to federally qualified health clinics, some prescription drugs, no mental health, no dental. But it works that way. Step in the Affordable Care Act. What does the Affordable Care Act do to Section 1902? 
it adds a new category of eligibility for adults between 18 and 64 who earn up to 133% of the federal poverty line. That's the Medicaid expansion that we're debating. It gets added to 1902. What's interesting is that section carries with it a whole lot of protections that are based in other parts of the act. It carries with it a special match. Remember, it's a federal state program. The money comes uh, from the federal government. The federal match is in Section 1905. And the Affordable Care Act amends Section 1905 to say, if you decide to cover this new group of adults, not only will you get federal money, you'll get 100% federal money for the first three years, and then it's going to be 90%, a very good match. States were quite surprised to realize, oh, there's a tie-in here. It's not really a choice or the secretary's choice whether we cover just adults up to 100% of poverty or some other number and how much federal money do you get. It's tied in together. The Affordable Care Act also makes clear that these newly eligible adults get a benefit package that is spelled out in Section 1937 of the Act. That's a benefit package that's a little different than traditional Medicaid. It doesn't include nursing home care. It's benchmarked to private plans. But it also comes with all of the cost-sharing protections in sections 1916 and 1916A of the Act, which say you can't charge premiums for people earning up to 133% of poverty, and very special protections on how what you can do in terms of cost sharing. No deductibles allowed, and cost sharing uh, limited, particularly for people under the poverty level. And the, what happens is governors go into these negotiations going, hey, before the Affordable Care Act, when I wanted to cover these adults, you'd let me put together a plan that didn't look like old Medicaid. I could put together a whole different system. That's what I want to do now. The substantive law has changed. There are protections in the act that the secretary doesn't have authority to waive. Ooh, but boy, there's a lot of pressure behind those closed doors when we talk about the negotiations, right? So that's the second part of what the Affordable Care Act does. It suddenly brings the Section 1115 negotiations out into the sunlight. It adds a new Section D to Section 1115. It's interesting. Section 1115 waivers apply to a lot of federal state programs, not just to Medicaid. This new Section D only applies to Medicaid and the children's health insurance program. It only applies to new waiver requests and extensions of waiver requests. But it requires that there now be state notice of waiver requests and an opportunity to comment. And after that's over, the state has to respond to all of those public comments. After the state comment period, there is also a federal comment period, uh, an opportunity to comment. And there's also a federal administrative record that's got to be online. All of this has to be online. Uh, for those of you who do administrative law, comment periods in this era of the internet are fascinating. States have to set up a website for their public comment. You're able to sign up for an email list so you know if something is being proposed. Arizona proposed something yesterday, I'll tell you about it. At the federal level, you can also sign up for emails and know when things are going to happen. So a lot of what we read and hear about in the press is what is initially being made public when a governor or a state legislature says, oh, we've got an idea for a waiver. This is what we're thinking about. 
And let me tell you what they're thinking about. Um, the other part of 1115D is that the regulations spell out now what the waiver request looks like, what has to be contained in it, and also what has to be contained in the special terms and conditions. And that's what the approval document is called for a waiver. The statute says the waiver request has to be detailed enough to allow for meaningful input from the public. CMS has issued regulations spelling out what that means in great detail. Uh, and here's a synopsis of it. You've got to spell out your goals and objectives in terms of an experiment, a pilot, or a demonstration. You've got to spell out which specific provisions of 1902 you want a waiver for. You've got to spell out how it's going to be budget neutral for the federal government. You've got to spell out your research hypotheses and the evaluation. It suddenly brings into the light the law of Section 1115. We're suddenly having a public discussion and an ability to evaluate CMS's, the Secretary's decisions to grant these waivers by being able to compare them with the law. And if you see what the special terms and conditions, they track the law too. We now know exactly which sections are waived, the budget neutrality, the time period. Time period becomes important because some of these waivers have been renewed for 30 years. Uh, evaluation design, evaluation reports must be made public. For the first time in about 25 years, we have a guarantee that on an annual basis and at the conclusion of these waiver projects, the evaluation reports, one, are approved by HHS, and two, must be made available to the public. And on an annual basis, there has to be a separate report to the public about the extent to which these experimental waivers are affecting outcomes, quality, and access. This is different. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, most of the waivers that were granted, particularly under the Bush administration, we never saw the evaluations. They did not have to be made public. They were typically not made public. Um, so here are the elements. There really are five elements to a Section 1115 waiver request. And for those of you who are law students in the room, you know, I, I hope as we go forward, we will see law journal articles identifying the five. Is, there, is it a provision in Section 1902 being waived? What's the experimental purpose? How does it promote the objectives of the Medicaid Act? What's the period of time, and is it an appropriate time period for what you're trying to test? And how does it affect budget neutrality? Those are the legal questions. That's what has to be addressed in these waiver proposals. How does it play out? Um, Arkansas was the first state that came forward with a waiver proposal. It caused a little bit of shock and awe as we read about it in the press. It was called a private option. We were told that Arkansas wanted to take all of the adults newly eligible for Medicaid and simply enroll them in marketplace plans. Well, that raised a lot of issues. Marketplace plans have higher premiums. They have higher cost sharing. They don't have all the benefits of Medicaid. What ended up happening, those are all protections outside of 1902. All of that was actually um, brought to light during the state comment period. If you look back at the public comments, the original waiver that Arkansas filed, you will see that between the time uh, they posted their draft waiver and they submitted a waiver to HHS, they dropped six of their requests for waivers down to three, and most of them in response to comments that 
what you want to do is not in Section 1902, a very technical legal argument. The waiver they got allows them to use Medicaid money to pay premiums to purchase marketplace plans for newly eligible adults, but those adults also get all the benefits and all the cost-sharing protections in Medicaid, and it's provided as a wraparound. They basically get two cards, a Medicaid card and a marketplace card and they use them for different uh, purposes. Uh, is there an experimental purpose? Absolutely. This is a really interesting experiment. Um, the goals are to see if there's better or different access to providers or different providers through marketplace plans, to see if there's better or worse enrollment in marketplace plans than in traditional Medicaid, and also to look at the comparative costs of using marketplace plans versus traditional Medicaid. Uh, why didn't we just use marketplace plans for everyone to begin with? Because the Congressional Budget Office told us it was going to cost substantially more to use marketplace plans than Medicaid. Um, and that's actually going to be the most interesting issue. Uh, CMS was willing to say that this was budget neutral for the federal government. Uh, the GAO has already issued a harsh report saying that the budget neutrality numbers were played fast and loose by CMS. So so just because we have new rules about budget neutrality doesn't mean that it's going to be followed in every case. IO comes right behind um, Arkansas, and it also wants to use marketplace plans, not for everyone who qualifies as newly eligible, but just for people earning uh, right at or above poverty, between 100% and 133%. And that's an interesting research hypothesis. Um, is that maybe a better system than covering everyone? Are the costs different? Do people move in and out of marketplace and Medicaid more at this level? These are actually two very very interesting experiments to see together in terms of waivers. Um, the second waiver that Iowa got was to not provide transportation to these newly eligible adults. A rural state. Why? Well, one reason is transportation is a benefit that's included in Section 1902. It is actually waivable. It's not a benefit that's in 1905 or 1937. That's kind of the technical reading of the statute. It's within the secretary's legal authority. I certainly question what the experimental value is, since we know from many studies that transportation uh, creates barriers to care. I'm not sure it furthers the purpose of the Medicaid Act. Uh, to withdraw this transportation. But I will say that the secretary said it will be for one year. That makes it kind of interesting. Let's, let's see after one year whether it creates barriers to care. And since the evaluation has to be public, maybe this is the way waivers are supposed to work. We'll find out something. We'll find out quickly how it works. I will tell you that Iowa has filed for a second waiver. They want to get a second year waiver on this transportation. The evaluations from year one finds that 20% of people earning below poverty were unable to go to a medical appointment because they didn't have transportation. For those earning between 100 and 133%, it was 10%. So there were also barriers there. It's going to be very interesting to see how the secretary uses her discretion uh, with this request. The more interesting part of Iowa, though, is that they asked to be able to use some healthy behavior incentives. During year one, there are no premiums. Can't charge premiums anyway, right? I told you that. Remember that? Can't charge premiums. Um, and if you go online and do a computerized risk assessment, fill in information about your smoking habits, your uh, cholesterol, your exercise regime, and if you go to your doctor and get a wellness checkup, in year two, you will not have to pay premiums. 
If you don't do those two things, in year two, you will have to pay a $5 premium each month if you earn below poverty, or a $10 premium if you earn above poverty. Poverty. There's a second part of these incentives, which is if you go for your dental checkup the first year, then you get enhanced dental benefits the second year. You get crowns, I think. You, only, you don't get crowns unless you get your dental checkup. So how does this happen? This is really interesting. Um, Secretary has no authority under Section 1902 to allow premiums. That's in 1916. The waiver documents are very interesting. They purport to waive provisions in 1916 of the Act, which she has no authority to do. Um, hmm, it's just sitting out there. I think the explanation is that the experimental value is combining the premiums with the healthy behavior incentives and packaging the two together to see if they impact and how they impact access to care. The slippery slope is that it's a premium. The compromise, and why I call it a premium light, if you're in under 100% of poverty and you don't pay your premium, you can't be cut off. If you earn over 100% of poverty, you can be cut off technically, but you can always file a hardship attestation, no proof required, saying I couldn't afford to pay my premium. What do we think were going on behind the closed doors? Well, when Iowa got public comments at the state level saying the secretary can't give you a waiver of premiums, when they filed their application with HHS for a waiver, they said, they didn't try to explain how can you give us premiums, they said, our state legislature said we must impose premiums. It says we must ask for a waiver of premiums. We are now asking for a waiver of premiums. Uh, you know, public process and public comment becomes interesting because at least you flesh out what's going on and the motivations. The explanation, the secretary doesn't have authority to, um, to impose premiums. I think they're trying to create something that looks like premiums to satisfy the legislation in Iowa, while at the same time, no harm, no foul, if no one loses their eligibility, we never really talk too much more about this. I will say this is the slippery slope that the secretary has really gotten her feet in a mud pile, and it's not going away. Because right after we saw Iowa, we see Michigan coming forward. They don't go through the whole public process, because remember, the public process uh, is for new waivers. They did a waiver amendment. Uh, I will give the secretary credit. She is posting waiver amendments and allowing public comment at the federal level. It is not required by the statute. But Michigan also has premiums and co-pays for people earning above 100%, 100 to 133%. It looks very much like Iowa, not imposed in the first year. There'll be healthy behavior incentives. If you don't comply with the healthy behavior incentives, you have to pay the premiums and co-pays in year two. We still don't know exactly what these healthy behaviors are gonna look like. And that gets us to Pennsylvania, the third in line. Um, so what did Pennsylvania want that it didn't get? work requirements, work incentives, um, problematic because that doesn't require a waiver of 1902. Uh, that's something that would be in addition to 1902. It's simply not in the legal authority. Uh, it also raises the question of whether it furthers the purpose of the Medicaid Act, particularly after the Affordable Care Act when we tried to move Medicaid from welfare it was only the deserving poor, either those who could work or could not work. This is a deserving poor concept. It also raises the problem of lots of administrative barriers to enrollment because it was built on having to prove how much you were working, having to prove that you were searching for work, all of those burdensome rules that are connected with welfare that make it hard to qualify, make it hard to stay on. Um, early on, oh, I have to say, Pennsylvania 
Pennsylvania's original draft application didn't comply with any of the requirements in 1115D in terms of giving you enough notice for meaningful input. Uh, you had no idea what was being proposed. We thought they wanted to do premium assistance, marketplace plans like Arkansas and Iowa that went by the wayside. They had lots of proposals for benefit reductions in tiering, none of which appear in their final waiver. Uh, and the benefit reductions were very problematic because they were proposals to reduce benefits to low-income parents who are getting Medicaid now. And none of that was allowed in the waiver. What is allowed in the waiver? Um, originally, Pennsylvania wanted waivers of 15 provisions of federal law. They got waivers of four, three of which are real waivers, and one isn't even required. Uh, they're allowed to enroll new eligible adults in managed care. That doesn't require a waiver. States have the authority to do that. They didn't have to get a waiver. Uh, they came on board, uh, no emergency non-emergency transportation to and from medical care for a year. Think of that as Iowa. And they have healthy behavior incentives, the same kinds of uh, incentives in year one. You need a wellness checkup. If you don't get your wellness checkup, you have to t pay premiums in year two. Um, the other wellness incentive is year one is you also have to make your co-pays. If you don't timely pay your copay when you go to the doctor or pick up a prescription drug, you will have to begin paying a premium in year two. The other troublesome part of Pennsylvania is they do have authority under the waiver in year two for people who have to pay premiums to terminate their Medicaid for non-payment of premiums but you're allowed to re-enroll immediately. So theoretically, there might be a gap. I think the compromise here was that Pennsylvania has asked for a six-month lockout, um, that if people did not pay their premiums, not only would they lose their Medicaid, they would not be able to get on Medicaid for a period of time. Um, and I can continue on. Indiana has one pending. They want work referrals. They want real premiums. They want premiums where there's no coverage for Medicaid until you pay your first premium. And if you don't pay the premium, uh, you get locked out for six months. They're going to put them into uh, HSA-like accounts. And here you'll see, again, no non-emergency transportation. Arkansas is back up for a second round of waivers. Uh, this time, they want, pen they want real premiums, and they want penalties for non-payment of premiums, and they're looking at deductibles and HSA-like accounts. So looking forward, what do I think happens? Um, there is a law of Section 1115. Uh, we are just learning that law because it's come to light. I think it's important that we educate legislators at the state level about how to read the statute and how to use the statute. But I think we also know there are some flashpoints here, and the flashpoints are going to be around premiums and cost sharing. They're going to be about locking people out and penalties for not paying them. They're going to be about barriers to care. And it's going to be problematic. Uh, I predict that these waivers are going to end up either in litigation or in a debate in Congress about whether the Medicaid protections for premiums and cost sharing remain in the statute. Uh, do I think that the waivers really create the flexibility that some of the reluctant states hoped? No, I don't. Uh, I do think the harder question, though, in terms of whether states like Indiana or Georgia or North Carolina are going to move forward is really about our attitudes toward the poor, about whether we believe that we can trust the poor or whether we have to put work requirements on them, and barriers, and lots of rules. And I also think it's a question of social justice and distributive justice about what is an appropriate safety net insurance system, and understanding that the lives of someone earning $5,000 a year 
is different from the lives of someone earning $40,000 a year. And where do I think we end up initially? What's at stake? Uh, these are some more Missourians. None of them have health insurance. They all want health insurance. So I want to bring us back to the faces of people involved here as I have a few minutes for your questions. Thank you. You uh, talk about this, you initially talk about this as a moral issue, which of course demonizes anyone who takes issue with the rest of the points you make. I think some of the legislative reluctance to accept the Affordable Care Act is based upon the fact that the money has to come from somewhere. As you should know and probably do know, Medicaid in most states is now either number one or number two in terms of state expenses, uh, rivaling education and transportation. So many of these machinations don't reflect a puritanism and a mistrust of the poor, but rather where the proverbial rubber meets the road. And many of these states find themselves uh, in dire financial situations. Some of the states you point out that have readily accepted the Affordable Care Act, such as Illinois, the state of New York, uh, face real uh, debt issues uh, that have to be addressed. So I think that there is, uh, I think that some of the proponents of the Affordable Care Act and the measures that the Affordable Care Act impacts on Medicaid, uh, rather than demonizing this, uh, there needs to be a good look as to how care can be rendered more effectively, more efficiently, and how these governors are going to balance their state budgets. Unlike the federal government, which can print money, state budgets can't. So I, I think that needs to be addressed um, in, in any way that you look at a Medicaid reform. I think those are all important points, and expanding Medicaid does not rule out making it a more efficient, more cost-effective system. My point about, you know, I think it's a moral issue is to express how important I think it is as an issue. And I think with our state budgets and our federal budgets, just as with our personal budgets, I find the money when it's important and when it is my priority. And my urging is that we make expanding Medicaid a priority. I can make the numbers work, and the numbers do work both for the state government and for the federal government. Uh, in Pennsylvania, in Missouri, and in every state, the match is generous enough that it actually costs states less to expand Medicaid than to do nothing. And I know that seems counterintuitive, but the reason is we presently spend a lot of state dollars on programs like mental health, which are funded 100% by state dollars, that if we expand Medicaid, we get the benefit of the federal match. Uh, money also becomes available to help people transitioning out of jails and prisons and to provide community-based services for people with substance abuse and mental health problems to keep them out of the jail system. So there, there are cost savings. At the federal level, the Congressional Budget Office told us when we passed the Affordable Care Act that it saves federal dollars over 10 years. It reduces the deficit because we are spending money primarily in Medicare to reimburse hospitals when people delay care, get sick, end up in the emergency room, and show up without insurance. So the dollars do work. And I, I am concerned about the dollars. And I do think we make the dollars work. But we make the dollars work for things we care about. Thank you.